Good afternoon, Mega Tendies, and welcome back to SMT Theology for the first time. Today, we'll be discussing angels. Angels have long been a part of the Megami Tensei franchise, and so we'll be discussing the biblical and theological accuracy of the depictions of the archangels from the game Shin Megami Tensei 4. First, we'll see how the designs were approached, then compare those designs to the depiction of angels in theology, and lastly, examine the origin and context of the phrase, be not afraid. Here's a little background before we get into the thick of it. Shin Megami Tensei 4 is a Japanese role-playing game developed by Atlas, and the series, Shin Megami Tensei, generally centers around demons, a catch-all term for all supernatural beings that are invading Tokyo. Our subject today is SMT4 because during its development, the company Atlas hired a team of guest artists to design the new demons that it would feature. We'll be specifically covering the designs by Keita and Mimiya, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, Uriel, and Merkaba. For all my Toku fans out there, you may know Emimiya from the Kamen Rider franchise. Keita and Mimiya's designs are very contentious in the Megaton fanbase, especially when compared to the Archangels from Shin Megami Tensei 2, designed by the series' previous head designer, Kazuma Kaneko. Kaneko's Archangels are fairly standard. They're all rainbow-colored people with wings and an armor. However, when we look at Emimiya's designs, they're all pretty unconventional and a portion of the fanbase has interpreted this to mean that these angels represent a sort of incomprehensible or abstract side of the Bible that's more accurate. And they're wrong. Let's talk about it. To start off with, let's get this out the way. MMEA's goals of these designs had nothing to do with this idea that biblical angels are some sort of like Lovecraftian elder gods. Actually, in a 2013 interview with Famitsu, MMEA said, what I focused most on when it came to Shin Megami Tensei IV's demon designs was the artificial beings aspect. I believe that since demons and angels are embodiments of human thoughts, they still are artificial beings, no matter how much they resemble living creatures. Demons and angels exist thanks to humans, basically. I can't really work with consulting materials and data, and that makes me feel realistic designs just don't sue me. When I give an idea form, it's only complete in my head. He further explained the context of his designs in the Shin Megami Tensei 4 official artworks, saying, The idea that machines, weapons, and other man-made things could be included in the gods and demons umbrella really whet my creative appetite. Needless to say, Cosma Kaneko, the father of form and design, really dealt the coup de gras, but nonetheless, it was a successful team effort that I was happy to be a part of. I tried working organic-looking machinery into the orthodox forms, faces, torsos, and arms of my god characters. That was my goal. In order to differentiate the four archangels from each other, I was sure to give them subtly different color schemes and varying forms. The biggest challenge was making sure my design images were usable as illustrations in the game itself. So not only does he not reference theological accuracy, but he also outright says he doesn't research because it doesn't suit him. I don't think there's any reason to think that he, at least personally, was considering theology at all while creating these designs. Granted, there is an argument that the Atlas staff directing him was, but we'll get into that later. For now, let's compare MMEA's angels with some biblical accounts, just for fun. So, are these angels biblically accurate? For this section, we will be specifically covering scripture considered canon. Now for those who don't know much about biblical study, biblical canon is the list of books that are the basis of a specific faith. And yes, this is the original context of the word canon. So none of the books we discuss here will be apocryphal, meaning non-canon, except for one at the end, which is kinda arguable and I'll explain when we get there. And before we get into it, I will say that some of the conceptions people have about this topic are largely based on esoteric descriptions of angels from like random mystic texts that date back to 200 AD. And but the thing is, none of these are recognized by church with any significant following. Like for example, the only one I could think of like, that would maybe fit this is the Book of Enoch, the first one. And that's only accepted by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. But even then, none of the angels I've seen mentioned in like, conversations like this would resemble the SMT4 angels, so it would be kind of pointless to bring it up regardless. Before we get into this, I need to explain one more thing. You all likely already know who the four archangels are, but I doubt the majority of you really know what Merkaba is supposed to be. Merkaba is not a name found in the Bible. It's a concept developed from passages in Ezekiel, which we're going to get into in a bit, and rather than being a singular being, it's more like a title of a function that several angels work together to do namely being the chariot of God. In fact, Merkaba is actually Hebrew for chariot. Later in Jewish mystical literature, 
the Merkabah would come to mean a sort of metaphor for enlightenment, and it denoted ascension. And these passages we're about to get into are very important for this conversation, because not only does it describe the Merkabah, but these verses are the biblical basis for the layman's understanding of abstract angels. We're going to focus on the description of these angels given in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 4-18 through 18, from the King James Bible. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and every one had four faces, and every one had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another, they turned not when they went, and they went, every one, straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward, two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went, every one straight forward, whither the spirit was to go, they went and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps, and went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth a lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, Behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures, with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. Now to clarify, the angels discussed in verses 4-14 through 14, as having four faces are known as the living creatures, or the Hayoth in Hebrew. Likewise, the angels in verses 15-18 through 18 are the whirling wheels, and this translates to Ophanim, or alternatively, Galgalim. I should note that Ezekiel isn't the only book in the Bible that describes heavenly bodies looking distinctly non-human. It's a pretty common theme in apocalyptic scripture, like Daniel, which we will discuss in detail later, and Revelations. Specifically, its description of Jesus Christ, found in chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. However, I've never actually seen someone use these as talking points, so I figure it's not really necessary to go over these in detail right now. But those descriptions, they sound like crazy, right? Angels are like Jewish chimera or something, and they go around with like flying eye wheels? What, what does that mean? So, let's add some context. In biblical scripture, there is no real, at least clear, standard of what angels are supposed to look like. You would already have an idea of this if you watched the intro video to the series, hint hint. So it should be known, this is not standard. In fact, if there was a standard, it would be that angels appear humanoid. You can even kind of see this when we see theologians go on to classify angels into ranks. And a very common theme in these is that the Hayoth and the Ophanim are placed higher above the more humanoid and messenger angels that we normally see. For example, let's take one of the more popular angelic hierarchies from Pseudodiagnosis's the Colesti Hierarchica. I think I said that right. And my SMT fans might recognize this one because this is the same list that Atlas uses. And we're gonna go from the lowest ranked angels to the highest ranked angels. The first set are the angels, the archangels, and the principalities. The second set is the powers, the virtues, and the dominions. And the last set is the thrones, the cherubim, and the seraphim. And we see that the Hayoth and the Ophanim belong in the highest sphere of heavenly bodies, as cherubim and thrones, which makes sense, because you know, they're closer to God. But as we go down, 
we see the more common messenger angels, or as the Jews call them, the Malach, and these are in the lowest sphere with the archangels. Furthermore, there are many instances of these Malach and archangels being mistaken for humans, being described as having human-like properties, or at the very least, the scripture being understood to have been implying that the angels had the appearance of human form. For instance, take the book of Daniel, which features the archangel Gabriel. In chapter 8, the titular prophet receives a vision from God and can't comprehend its meaning. We see the following in verses 15 through 17. And it came to pass when I, even I Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid, and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Then, in chapter 9, verse 21, Daniel thinks back on his encounter with Gabriel, saying, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. For examples of scripture believed to imply that quote-unquote men were angels, we have Genesis 18, verses 1-2, through two, wherein God, accompanied by two men, visits the patriarch Abraham at his home. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground. Genesis chapter 32, verses 24 to 29, wherein the patriarch Jacob wrestles with another quote-unquote man. Verses 24 and 25 read, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. But this one's a little iffy, because if you know about this story, you know that in the end, verse 30 specifically, this happens. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And this would seem to be clearly and explicitly saying, this is God. Jacob fought God and won. But a good amount of people think that this was an angel actually, and not literally God. So just do me a favor and roll with it. You know how it goes, different versions, different denominations, it's, it's whatever. Now, let's look at some deuterocanonical scripture. I've already explained what a canon is, but the issue with the canon in the first place is that some churches don't respect the canon of other churches. This is where the term deuterocanon comes in. It refers to a second set of canonical books that's considered apocryphal depending on who you're talking to. The one I'm discussing today is the Book of Tobit, which is accepted by both Catholicism and the Orthodoxy, but not Protestants. In Tobit chapter 5, the titular character, Tobit, sends his son Tobias on a journey. While preparing for it, Tobias is introduced to the Archangel Raphael. We'll be reading from verses 4 and 5 from the King James Version with Apocrypha American Edition. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Therefore, when he went to seek a man, he found Raphael that was an angel. But he knew not, and he said unto him, Canst thou go with me to rages, and knowest thou those places well? So, what we have here is a series of angels, archangels even, being portrayed as human. And even the ones that weren't, are distinct in that. Now we've already established that angels do appear in human form. But, for us, that simply raises new questions. Because to be fair, Christianity emphasizes the spiritual nature of its belief system. So naturally, there would be the argument that since angels are spiritual beings, they may not have physical bodies. So we ask ourselves, even assuming that angels have the ability to look human, what if that's simply an illusion? Do angels have a true form? And what is the nature of that form if it does exist? And there is actual biblical precedence for this with Psalm chapter 4 verse 4. Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. The book said to be written by the Apostle Paul, the Pauline letters, sort of imply it? We can look at verses like Ephesians 6.12, which states, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
we also have 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 39 through 40. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So what does any of this actually mean? Sadly, the Bible does not go into much detail. So, we're going to go look at some early church theology to see how back then people perceived angels. FYI, a lot of this section will be taken from the book by St. Thomas Aquinas, Summa Theologica, specifically the 50th question, the substance of angels absolutely considered. It's generally understood that angels occupy some sort of space between the physical and the spiritual. For instance, we have the Fide Orthodoxa by St. John of Damascus. It states that an angel is an ever movable intellectual substance and logic would follow that by virtue of their ability to move that they would be at least in part physical. Furthermore, St. Basil the Great's De Spiritu Sancto positions all creatures as having an inherent, inescapable nature. And once again, logic would follow that by virtue of being limited, that would mean all creatures are corporeal. Then we add that with the context of Psalms chapter 148, verse 2. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Then skipping to verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. This positions the angels as something created, as creatures, which are in turn limited, and therefore corporeal. Aquinas' opposing argument was that angels were created by God to be spirits of intelligence, but intelligence in the Catholic sense, which, according to the New Advent Encyclopedia, signifies the higher spiritual and cognitive power of the soul. And this means that angels were not physical, but that the prophets had simply mistook the angels for being physical because they were not aware of this concept. Later, the medieval Jewish philosopher Maimonides questioned the existence of angels entirely, saying in his book, Guide to be Perplexed, All forces are angels. How great is the blindness of ignorance and how harmful. If you told a person who is one of those who deem themselves one of Israel's sages that the deity sends an angel who enters the womb of a woman and forms the fetus there, he would be pleased with this assertion and would accept it and would regard it as a manifestation of greatness and power on part of the deity. But if you tell him that God has placed in the sperm a formative force shaping the limbs, and that this force is a malach, the man would shrink from this opinion. And we see a similar line of thought echoed in the Summa Theologica. The concept that angels were not literal beings of form, but simply appear in the imaginations of prophets. This idea would be rejected by Aquinas due to the amount of times that angels appear to groups of people. Note that what makes this distinct from the earlier assertion is that when Aquinas uses the term imagination, it implies a relation to the senses, which makes it a physical phenomena, and like the intellect, which is spiritual, a supernatural phenomena. This sentiment is not unheard of, even among modern theologians. In 1860, Dr. David Friedrich Strauss wrote the book, The Life of Jesus Christ Critically Examined, and in it he wrote, the phenomena in the natural world and the transitions in human life, which were formerly thought to be wrought by God himself through ministering angels, we are now able to explain by natural causes, so that the belief in angels is without a link by which it can attach itself to rightly apprehended modern ideas, and it exists only as a lifeless tradition. The result is the same if, with one of the latest writers on the doctrine of angels, we consider as the origin of this representation man's desire to separate the two sides of his moral nature and to contemplate, as beings existing external to himself, angels and devils. For the origin of both representations remains merely subjective, the angel being simply the ideal of a created perfection which, as it was formed from the subordinate point of view of a fanciful imagination, disappears from the higher and more comprehensive observation of the intellect. And, as you can guess, it was very controversial at the time, and honestly, it definitely still would be among laymen. It would probably be more used to this more modern Catholic take, which also discards the physical nature of angels, but instead understands them as being literal while entirely spiritual. In July 30th, 1986, Pope John Paul II said this as part of his catechesis, creator of the things unseen. Before I read the quote, a catechesis is like a sort of short sermon before a baptism. 
According to sacred scripture, the angels, inasmuch as they are purely spiritual creatures, are presented for our reflection as a special realization of the image of God, the most perfect spirit, as Jesus himself reminds the Samaritan woman in the words, God is spirit. From this point of view, the angels are creatures closest to the divine exemplar. Then a week later on August 6th, he added to his previous comments, in his catechesis, angels participate in the history of salvation. The faith of the church recognizes certain distinctive characteristics of the nature of the angels. Their purely spiritual being implies first of all their non-materiality and their immortality. The angels have no body, even if in particular circumstances they reveal themselves under visible forms because of their mission for the good of men. And therefore they are not subject to the laws of corruptibility which are common to all the material world. And we could go on and on, but you probably get the point. There is no definite answer to this question, it really hinges on where you stand personally on the topic, and that's totally up to you. But hey, for the sake of discussion, let's continue under the assumption that they are abstract. Under these circumstances, in my opinion, in the context of the SMT4 Archangels, this becomes less of, is this accurate, and more, could this have been done better? Assuming the goal was for the Archangels to be abstract, which again, it wasn't, but if it was, I mean... I guess they did that, but it comes off as really thoughtless in the context of biblical accuracy. Let's look at the other artist, Kazuma Kaneko. Kaneko certainly had a lot of designs that weren't necessarily accurate, but largely they were the products of fastidious study, and when he did sacrifice literal representation, it was for creative interpretation based on his study. Let's take his Metatron for instance. The robotic appearance is meant to represent Metatron's nature as an angel, in his total obedience to God. It may also correlate with the designs Sandalphin and Victor from the game Devil Summoner, as all of these figures were humans who were transformed into angels. I think this is a really great way to keep the design interesting, while also being faithful to the ideology behind it. And in turn, I think a really interesting way to have abstract angels would be to have them represented by a series of like, shapes or silhouettes to represent the ties the early church had with Neoplatonism or Pythagoreanism. Neoplatonism was like a set of loosely connected philosophers expending on Plato's work. What they generally shared was a belief in something called the monad, which was seen as infinite, beyond all descriptions, and the source of all things. Pythagoreanism was a Greek school of thought and was actually founded by the guy who discovered math. Fun fact, I know. But they deified numbers and by extension mathematics, believing that the universe was predicated on the existence of certain ratios that acted as a sort of cosmic glue and they even went as far as to use math as a moral proof. And they were really big on numerology. It's even been argued that it's related to Gematria Kabbalah. To explain in short, this is basically what those boomer Christian conservative conspiracy theorists do. When they try to match certain letters with certain numbers to find like mystic meaning in, in what seems like the mundane. Somehow, it always adds up to 666, right? Who could have guessed? I think a design that could showcase this well is something like the Angel Ramiel from the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion. Granted, I'm sure it wasn't on purpose, but still, I think it's a really cool design in the context of the history of Jewish and Christian theology. I can hear some of y'all in the comments already. What? Geometric angels? Aren't angels supposed to be scary? Isn't that why they say to not be afraid? And the answer is no, shut up. Well, okay, I'm kidding, but still, it's kind of complicated. First, I should say that this does actually occur in the Bible a few times, or at least some variant of it. And for this video, I've counted seven of these in this context, but I think that the argument that angels say it, especially at large, because of their appearance is flimsy at best, and at worst, like actually kind of harmful. I'm not going to get into that here, but if you're really interested, you could ask me later. But anyway, let's look at our examples. The expulsion of Hagar, Genesis 21:17. Daniel's vision at the Tigris River, Daniel 10, 12. The empty tomb, Matthew 28, 5. The heralding of John the Baptist, Luke 1, 13. The heralding of Jesus Christ, Luke 1, 30. Angelic visitation to the shepherds, Luke 2, 10. And Paul's vision on the Mediterranean Sea, Acts 27, 24. However, out of all of these, the only ones we're gonna take an extensive look at are Daniel's vision at the Tigris, the empty tomb, and the heralding of John the Baptist. The other ones have a few issues. They either A, don't have context for why the angel is saying fear not, i.e. 
the angelic visitation to the shepherds, and Paul's vision on the Mediterranean, or B, they're easily explained. For instance, in the expulsion of Hagar, the reason the angel says not to fear is made very clear. It's because Hagar thought her son would die of dehydration. And in the heralding of Jesus Christ, the angel tells Mary not to fear because she's troubled by what she's being told. We can start with Daniel's vision at the Tigris River. But before we get into the verse, let's talk about the context in which this verse is written. The book of Daniel is set during the Babylonian exile, a period in which the Jews are forcefully relocated to the city of Babylon. Daniel 10 in particular is set at the end of this period and is meant to be a prelude for chapters 11 and 12, wherein the angel from chapter 10 gives Daniel an apocalyptic prophecy concerning the city of Jerusalem. In chapter 10, we see Daniel in the middle of a fast, traveling with companions along the Tigris River. Here we read verses 5 through 7. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Upaz. His body was also like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Then skipping to verses 11 and 12. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So, while this chapter does in fact reference the appearance of the angel, verse 7 specifies that the people with Daniel did not actually see the angel as they ran away, even though it still had a similar effect on them. I think it's more likely to be addressing Daniel's fear for the Jewish people. Well, let's look at the specific way the angel phrases the sentence in verse 12. Fear not, dot dot dot, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, yada yada yada, and I am come for thy words. In my opinion, this is a clear implication that the angel is referring to Daniel's prayer prior to his arrival, especially considering that the prophecy that the angel would deliver in chapters 11 and 12 is directly related to the future of the Jews. Next, we have the empty tomb. This story is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To start off with, we will be looking at the version in Matthew 28, specifically verses 1 through 5. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake, and became as dead men. And the angel answered, and said unto the women, Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. So verse 3 describes the angel's appearance as having a countenance like lightning. And if you remember, we also saw this in Daniel 10.6. Basically, it's understood to mean that they were shining, not that they were like literally lightning, you know. But speaking of Daniel 10, I think another interesting bit is how what happened to the tomb guards sort of mirrors what happens to the men traveling with Daniel. It doesn't say whether or not they actually see the angel, but they feel a trembling when the angel appears and aren't present for the rest of the vision. Initially, when I read this, I figured that the fear not referred to how they were feeling about Jesus, but their encounter with the angel ends in Matthew 28, 8 with this. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And that would be a really weird way to phrase it if that was the case. Now, I think it does actually refer to the fear of the presence of the angel. However, there's not much reason to think it's due to their appearance when you consider the other versions of the story in the Gospels, though not total retellings do directly call the angel a man or men. It's most clear in Luke chapter 24, verses 1-5. through 5. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre, and they entered in, and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, 
two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why ye seek the living among the dead? And again, in the much shorter Mark 16, 5. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were frightened. And lastly, we have the heralding of John the Baptist. This story centers on a priest named Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, a couple too old to have children. We'll be reading from Luke 1, 11 through 13, as Zacharias begins to perform his religious duty. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call him John. So this one does directly say that he was afraid upon seeing the angel, but we can knit this in the bud quickly, because in verse 19, the angel introduces themselves as Gabriel, and we already know that Gabriel appears as a man. Furthermore, Gabriel is also the archangel who appears to Mary 15 verses later to prophesy her virgin pregnancy, and there's no mention of her reacting to his appearance. Personally, what I think is more likely here is that Zacharias fears what Gabriel wants with him, especially considering right after Gabriel introduces himself, he says this in verse 20. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not be able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Honestly, I'd argue the Jews' reverence for angels is way more likely to be the reason for the angels saying fear not. There's a long history of fear of angels, even going back to the time of the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 23, 20 and 21, God told Moses this, I am going to send an angel in front of you, to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Be attentive to him and listen to his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. Furthermore, there's a bunch of examples of Jews meeting angels not knowing their true identity, then when they realize this, they become deathly afraid. In Judges 6, we see the judge Gideon met with a visitor. When he brings out a gift for his guest, the angel performs a miracle, disappears, and this follows in verses 21 and 23. Then Gideon perceived that it was the angel of the Lord, and Gideon said, Help me, Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. In Judges 13, we see the parents of the judge Samson. You probably know him, the strong guy, a natural nappy headed king, you know. His mother was visited by an angel who prophesied his birth. When his father prayed to God to send the man back so he could tell them what they should do with Samson, the angel returned. Then the couple prepared a burnt offering to God, and by that, I mean they sacrificed a baby goat. As the smoke rose to the sky, the angel went with it. Upon seeing this, they realized they saw an angel, and in verse 22, Samson's father said, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. So this is a motif we see again and again, even going back to that story of Jacob wrestling an angel in Genesis 32:30, where he says, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. For me personally, this theory has way more backing in scripture, especially considering that if you recall, the majority of the scripture with angels that say fear not do not even reference the appearance of those angels. As we're winding down, let's take another look at the Amamiya quote from the beginning. What I focused most on when it came to Shin Megami Tensei IV's demon designs was the artificial beings aspect. I believe that since demons and angels are embodiments of human thoughts, they still are artificial beings, no matter how much they resemble living creatures. Demons and angels exist thanks to humans, basically. I can't really work with consulting materials and data, and that makes me feel realistic designs just don't sue me. When I give an idea form, it's only complete in my head. So not only did Amamiya personally not base his archangel designs off of theological interpretation, we see that there's not much shared even accidentally between them and their biblical counterparts. Using this lens, even though the angels were explicitly supernatural, they had nothing to do with any theological precedence, outside of looking vaguely unsettling. However, unlike the others, Merkaba has some really specific elements that do appear to be referential to some degree. Heads up, because we're about to get into some spoilers. 
a little bit of SMT2 for, for Apocalypse, which is sort of like a pseudo sequel to SMT4. So, you know, tread lightly. So let's get into it. If you remember, Merkaba and Theology is a group of angels, while Merkaba and SMT4 is a fusion of angels. Merkaba and Theology is made of the four-headed Hayoth and the eyed wheels Ophanum, while Merkaba's first form in SMT4 features the four heads of the Archangels, and its second form is kinda circular. Frankly though, all of this is pretty loose, and kinda seems like a stretch if you were to look at them in a vacuum. But if it was on purpose, I'm skeptical that these design choices were from Amamiya and not Atlas Staff. Let's go back to Shin Megami Tensei 4 official artworks. In it, Amamiya also mentioned that the higher ups at Atlas told him what direction to take the designs. Now, let's add this with the clear parallels between his designs and the themes of SMT4 and the Shin Megami Tensei series at large. Throughout the series, there are multiple instances where characters refer to angels as mindless robots. We've already discussed Metatron, but for another example, in SMT4, in the area of Blasted Tokyo, we literally see the angels create one, namely Pluto. Furthermore, we see a repeated theme of the higher level angels being more of a moral gray, which is really overt with demons like Mastema in Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey, who also appears in SMT4, and Satan in Shin Megami Tensei 2, and Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse. This may be why Murgaba's second form is half light and half dark. I think all of this naturally leads into the question of how involved was he with the production of SMT4? Granted, he was a designer, so he likely had an idea of what was going on, especially when looking at the correlation between the designs and the series themes, but I don't think there's much to go off of for us to know whether or not he was actively contributing to the writing, rather than him going off concepts that were already established without him. So to close this video, I get that the mechanical look relates heavily to the themes of obedience and, and how it lends to the sense of modernity, but I feel like the way it was executed here was lazy. Personally, I would have liked them to play more with the concept of human thought and the fluidity of culture and religion. Now don't get me wrong, I don't think they have to ditch the tech angle. It's so weird saying that after saying Angel like 10,000 times. But I'd really prefer something more specific to Christianity, like maybe have the angels represent different mediums, eras of religious art, or like major theological movements. You know, something to think about. Hey look, that's the whole video. I finished it. Yay, woo. Uh, Mr. Miracle never, but the next video will probably be comic related. I don't know. I got a few ideas. We'll see. Now let's thank all my happy helpers. Let me see here. Ither, Beadman, Day, Envy, Feedy. I think Feedy is fed. I don't know. I never asked him for real for real. KDA, Kaduk, Koro, LaRue, Mead, Nocto, Tectotic Improv, and Toya VA. Special shout outs to uh, Nocto for helping me edit my script. My editor, KDA. My, my audiologist, I don't know. I don't know. Sorry for that. Mixer, master, I don't know. He, he in the booth. Also, Toya VA for, uh, he did me a real favor doing this for me, you know? So uh, shout him out. Uh, follow him, you know, the Twitters and whatever. I'll link something he worked on in the description. But he's a real VA, a voice actor. Like and subscribe to your friends. Time travel to 1812 and smash the Liberty Bell. Uh, you know the rest. That's it, really. That's goodbye. See ya until 2025. That's how slow I write.